Hola, kitties! It's that moment you've all been waiting for, the final lesson in Unit 4 on Circular Motion and Gravity. So hold on to your hats. Away we go! Now, the final lesson in this unit actually goes back to something we've already spoken about uh, to expand on it a little bit. So that's Newton's law of universal gravitation. Every particle in the universe attracts every other particle with a force directly proportional to the product of the masses and inversely proportional to the square of the distance between them. So we know that if we want to calculate the force that exists uh, between two objects, that we need to know the mass of the first object and the mass of the second object. And uh, once we know that, then we can use them together with g, the universal gravitation constant, and r squared, where r is the distance between the two objects. The universal gravitational constant uh, is 6.673 times 10 to the negative 11th. You don't have to worry about all of these little uh, units over here. I'm never going to ask you that, but you do need to use the gravitational constant. Um, I generally use 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11th. And, of course, uh, the law of attraction, uh, gravity between two objects, is uh, going to follow Newton's third law. So uh, one object exerts a force on the other object, and the other object exerts the same force on the first object. They pull at each other, and the amount of force is determined by using the law. Also, uh, something we already do, but this is the justification for it, it's called Gauss's Law. And it simply says that um, if you have a uniform sphere like the Earth or the Moon um, and it exerts a gravitational force, we can consider all of its uh, force to be exerted from the center of the sphere. So we draw a little circle and you know we, we say, okay, here's the Earth, but we're going to pretend that the entire mass of the Earth is at the center of the Earth right here. So that if we have the Earth and we have the Moon, then we use the center of the Earth, we use the center of the Moon, we measure the distance between those two things, uh, and we call that the radius. Okay, so that's R, that's the radius. All right, so all things I think you already probably knew. Now we're going to apply them uh, to a situation involving three billiard balls. Now we don't usually think about it, but you know, since every particle of matter in the universe exerts a gravitational force on every other particle on, in the universe, then these balls are all exerting forces on one another. Now, they're extraordinarily tiny forces, and of course we can't really measure them, but they exist. And so what we're going to do now is we're going to try to calculate the force that they exert upon one another. So we have uh, 0.3 kilogram billiard balls, and remember we will want kilograms as a measurement of mass. And they're on the table, and they're forming the corners of a right triangle, as shown. We want to find the net gravitational force on the cue ball, which is the uh, white ball down here. That's the cue ball, in case you don't play pool. Um, resulting from the forces exerted by the other two balls. All right, and I'm going to skip part B of this one. So, first of all, uh, two gravitational forces will act on the cue ball. We must find their magnitudes and then add them as vectors to find the result. And this is a simple matter of vectors, okay? We're just going to figure out the amount of force that the balls exert on the cue ball, and we're going to then find the magnitude of that force by solving them as vectors. So, if, uh, as I've drawn in the picture here, um, you've got uh, you got to understand this notation here, like F21 means the force that ball 2 exerts on ball 1. Okay, so the force that ball 2 exerts on ball 1. So here's ball 2, M M2, and here's ball 1, M1. So M2 is pulling at M1. So you see this little blue line pulling upward there. So that's the force that M2 exerts on M1. And so it's called F21. Now, what is it in Newtons? Well, the amount that it is in Newtons, we use g m1 m2 over r squared. We use Newton's law. So here's our g, 6.76 times 10 to the negative 11th. And in this case, both balls, actually all the balls, have the same exact mass, which is 0.3 kilograms. So this 0.3 stands for m1, this 0.3 stands for m2, and then down here we have the radius between them, 0.4 meters, and we have to remember to square that. So over here we have a very small amount of force, extraordinarily small, but you know it's a number, and that's what we're going to use for our force, 3.8 times 10 to the negative 11th newtons. 
down here, F3-1, all right, now that's the force that is exerted by ball 3 on ball 1. So F3-1, okay, so here's ball 3, and it's pulling at ball 1. So that little blue arrow right there shows ball 3 pulling at ball 1. So these two arrows here are really the two forces that we're talking about. And we want to resolve them. We want to just add them as vectors and find the resultant, which is going to be this force here. So using the law again, we calculate that um, the force that it, ball 3 is exerting on ball 1 is 6.76 times 10 to the negative 11th. So these are the two forces, and they're, they're magnitudes, and we're going to put them together into the Pythagorean theorem here and solve to get the magnitude of the resultant force. And that's really all there is to this problem. It's just a question of finding out how much force there is and then solving them as vectors. All right, so you can take a look at this one and try it. Same situation, same three balls. We want to find the magnitude and this time the direction of the force exerted by M1 and M3 on M2. So ball M1 down here and M3 over here. Again, now they're both pulling at ball M2. So here's one of the forces. This is the uh, white ball, the cue ball, pulling at M2. And so I'm calling that F12. And this force here is ball 3 pulling at ball 2. So that's F32. <clears throat> and again, I've set, I've set up a little X and Y system through ball 2 so that I can analyze the forces that are pulling on it. And we know how to do that now. So... Um, and I've noticed I put an angle in here, angle phi, and uh, it's it's 53 degrees, and I've gotten that because, um, well, we'll see in a second. So um, first thing I want to do is resolve into components. Now notice in the previous problem, the two forces were already at right angles. Okay, so these are already components. I mean, if you want to put a x and y axis through the cue ball like this, right? And this, you see how those two forces were already components. They were they were ready to be put into the Pythagorean theorem. Here, we have a situation where ball three is pulling at an angle on ball two. Now, ball one is pulling straight down on ball two, so this is fine. We don't have to worry about F12, but we do have to worry about F32. It's got to be broken into components. So I have my little chart over here. F12, notice, has no x component. It's simply pointing downward, which is a y component, so it's negative. But F32 has a positive component, which is going to go to the right, and it has a negative component, which is going to go down. So we're going to resolve F32 into its components, which I've done here, using cosine and sine of the 53 degree angle. And now at the bottom here, we find out that the tip of the arrow is going to be uh, in the fourth quadrant. Okay, so this is a positive, common, negative. Remember that gives you the tip of the arrow. So if you go over positive, down negative, I'm not saying exactly where it is, but it's somewhere in the fourth quadrant. So um, finding the magnitude now, we know how to go through the Pythagorean theorem and do that. And the direction, second tangent of the y number over the x number. Again, remembering that we will not have any uh, uh, negative numbers in there. So we get 75.7 degrees. Okay. All right. So the resultant here, I didn't actually draw a picture of it, of the resultant, but you have its magnitude and you have its uh, direction. All right, now the next thing that we've looked at already kind of is uh, gravitational attraction. So now we're talking about a planet and the gravitational acceleration that that planet exerts on objects. So here we have an astronaut standing on the surface of Ceres, the largest asteroid, drops a rock from a height of 10 meters, and it takes 8.06 seconds to hit the ground. So right away, sounds like some PVAT stuff there. We have to calculate the acceleration of gravity on Ceres. And then we have to find the mass of series when we know the radius of series. And then we have to calculate the gravitational acceleration 50 kilometers from the surface of series. So number one, the acceleration of gravity on series is not 9.8. That's the acceleration of gravity on Earth. On series, it's going to be something different. So the information they've given us 
to begin the sorry about that the information they've given us to begin the problem here is PVAT information and the purpose of it is to help us figure out what the acceleration of gravity on series is so here's my PVAT setup right I have initial velocity I have time I have distance dropped negative 10 and my question mark is acceleration going through PVAT and using this formula um, and remembering of course to change well we're gonna get to that soon <clears throat> we get acceleration is negative 0 0.308 meters per second squared. So, in other words, instead of 9.8 on series, it's 0 0.308. Now, going to part B, I'm going to show you this formula, and I'm going to explain it in the next problem. But this formula is a formula for, for calculating the acceleration of gravity on a planet, all right, any planet. So, M1 stands for the mass of that planet, and then R square stands r stands for the um, radius of that planet so <clears throat> we'll see in a second why this works this was calculated from newton's law of gravitation but so now we know that that the uh, gravity on series is 0 0.308 so we're going to put that in here and over here we have g and m1 is what we're trying to find out <clears throat> the mass of series <clears throat> and on the bottom here, we have the radius, which is 510,000 meters. Notice that's been changed from kilometers to meters. And, of course, it has to be squared. This whole thing, when we solve it, gives you an answer of 1.2 times 10 to the 21st kilograms. All right, now that's the mass for series. Now, third thing we have to do. If you were to increase the uh, radius says we have to increase, uh, calculate the gravitational acceleration 50 kilometers from the surface of Ceres. So again, what you're basically doing there is you're increasing the radius that you are away from uh, the planet. So we simply add that number, 50 kilometers, which is um, 50,000, 50, is it? Sorry, I keep going back and forth here. Yeah, okay. So this increases the radius by 50,000. And so I've simply taken 510,000, which is the radius of series, and I've added the 50,000 onto it to give me 560,000, which again, I have to remember to square. I know the mass of series because I found that in part B. And so we, we plug this in here and find um, that the acceleration of gravity would be 0.259 meters per second squared, which of course, we, you should expect that as you get further away from a planet, that the pull of the planet is going to decrease so that the acceleration that the planet creates is going to get less. All right, so take a look at this one here. Um, here's where I want to explain that formula that we just looked at. So uh, in part B here, we have the law of universal gravitation. So I'm going to set up a situation here. M1 is going to be the mass of a planet, any planet. M2 is the mass of an object on the surface of that planet. Now, what's the force that's going to be exerted between these two objects? Well, so G M1 M2 over R squared is going to tell us the force that's exerted. So if the second object is U and M2 is your mass, then this is telling you the force that's being exerted by the planet on you. Well, what do we call that? We call that force your weight, right? So that force is going to equal your weight. Well, that's M2G. We're used to that, your mass times the force of gravity. So what I want to do is I want to use this to solve for G. So you'll notice on both sides you have M2. M2 cancels. And when you solve for G, you get just G M1 over R squared. So that's the formula I used in the previous problem, where M1 stands for the mass of the planet that you're talking about, and R stands for the radius of the planet that you're talking about. So this is a formula you can use to figure out the gravitational acceleration on any planet, as long as you know the planet's mass and the planet's radius. Now, in part A again here, it says find the acceleration due to gravity on the planet. They've given you PVAT information. It takes 2.4 seconds to fall 5 meters on this planet. So again, I've simply plugged that into PVAT using this formula, and I've determined the acceleration of gravity on this planet, 1.74. And then finding the planet's mass is just about taking this formula that we just talked about, G equals G M1 over R squared. And we just found out that G on this planet is 1.74. And... Um, we're trying to find its mass, and the radius is 5,250 kilometers. So I have all the numbers that I need, and I turn kilometers, of course, into meters, and I plug it all into the formula and solve for M1. Okay.
Now, there's just two little things I want to mention before we close this lesson. It was asked in class at one point, how, how did the gravitational constant get calculated? And I referred to a man named Cavendish who had uh, done an experiment. Here's kind of a, what his experiment looked like. And he was simply trying to measure the angle through which um, this little setup would turn. And by measuring the angle, like this, uh, these blue balls here are attracting these brown balls um, with a, a very, 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 very small force of gravity. But he had the whole thing suspended from like a string here so that even the tiniest amount of gravitational attraction would pull a tiny bit and would turn it, cause it to turn a little bit. And by careful measurement, he was able to calculate the gravitational constant that we use 6.76 times 10 to the negative 11th. And of course, um, one thing you should know, we just looked at this formula here um, and how we got this for calculating gravity. And something you just need to realize, as I said, as you get further and further away from Earth, the value of G does change. In fact, when you get up on top of a mountain, um, a high mountain, the gravity, the gravitational acceleration does change. Um, so if you look at altitude here versus the value of G, you can see, you know, as you get higher off the Earth, the value of G goes down, 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 down. And that is the end of the news. Have a great day.